So selling cocaine and selling this and selling that, it wasn't it, at that time. It wasn't really an ethical thing. It just didn't make sense to me. It's like, dude, I get busted with two hundred grams of that. And I'm I'm going bye bye, and and I know what that looks like, right? You're doing eighty five and, and all mm-hmm. that. And I was like, I'm not willing to do all that. But hey, you know, like uh, fifteen pounds from Cali every week from uh, from the sour diesel man. That sounds like a plan. That sounds like a plan, and uh, that scales up really quickly, and uh, especially when you're not getting high, right? And then I found my my DOC, and I, I use the, the air quotes here because I would say ketamine's my DOC, but it was the one thing they didn't test for. So you know, I'm on a color code. I got to call in every weekday before 3 p.m. I better show my ass up and drop and all that, and uh, I just didn't want to get in trouble. So I'm doing this stuff, and I hated it. It was like a rave thing, and I was like, uh, it's just something to do, right? But eventually you get a taste for something. And um, by the end of that year, though, man, I was completely out of my mind. I didn't trust anybody around me. I was doing extremely stupid stuff. Take three. Take three. This is it. I'm going to let you take it from the top. Introduce yourself, man. Tell us a little bit about yourself, V. (laughs) What's up, folks? I'm V. Um, My name is V Hung. It's... uh, We'll go there. It's a Sanskrit name, as I was saying uh, before uh, you did exactly what I did, which mm-hmm. is jack the audio of it's hard. It, folks, it's hard to run a podcast. Just, just so you know, this is not a, this is not all fun and games. Right. So kudos to you. But, you know, my name is V Hung. Uh, I hail from uh, India, born in India originally. Um, I go by V, though. And I was kind of telling you off camera, I earned that name, man. I earned it. OK. You know, so I was in uh, fifth grade, new school, which happened a lot when I was a kid. And uh you should really be in a WWF before turning to WWE. I remember when it was WWF. Yeah, that was my, that was my stuff growing up, man. Mm-hmm. It was my stuff. And uh, anyway, so I'm wrestling with some 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 friends outside of this new elementary school, and I'd always gone by V Hung, and it, you know it was always a weird name uh, for me growing up, getting picked on, bully, and I was like, man, I'm such such a weird name, you yeah, know. In America, especially, right? You know what's messed up? It's actually a weird name in India too. Okay, so it was I go to man, I go to India, right? And I'm thinking like, all right, cool, I'm gonna tell people my name. They're gonna be like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like that's like a that's like Tom over right, here, right? Right. Hell no. no, hell no. They're like, what? The what? That's a weird name. I was like, I was like, so that's where V comes from. Yeah, yeah, but you know, it's uh. And so anyway, I like you know I put the guy in the walls of Jericho, and uh, they were like, "Dang, yeah, Indian dude got 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 some got some some dog in him, right?" <laughs> so he goes, uh, "We're gonna call you V. We gotta give him a nickname, right?" And, right. Uh, and I like I like I like getting, earning the nickname. Yeah, you know, well, you gotta earn it. Mean. That's what we said too off camera. But you yeah. definitely gotta earn a nickname, man. You can't just be given a nickname for no reason. Yeah, you're yeah. earning them. That's it, man. So you know, I go by V and. Um, I do uh, do a lot of stuff at the moment. Do do a lot of uh, marketing. I'm in real estate, so I got like two two transactions going on right now. This that, but you know, obviously we're on we're on this show where I have a I have a bit of a past, man. So I've grown up, moved around a lot. Uh, Tampa is kind of uh, where my uh, my heyday was, right? My stomping grounds, my original stomping grounds. West Tampa, when the University of South Florida for a short period of time. Okay, so that college thing. Yeah, but I mean, even before college, right? Like my senior year, I remember uh, getting called down to the principal's office, and he's like, you know, you think you're in a gang? You think you're selling drugs? You're hanging out with some people? And mind you, I'm just, I'm just kind of, uh, what's the term? In, in smuggling terms, there's the camel and there's the donkey. Right. The donkey knows they're smuggling. The, the camel doesn't. He just thinks he's getting high, hanging out with his friends, and driving the car. Right. So I was just this naive, sheltered little kid, trying to fit in, be cool, and um, you know, I smoke weed and. Uh, they were selling it. I just wanted to smoke for free, right? Right. And uh, so I'm getting in trouble in the principal's office. My parents, you know, funny, I think most people go to go to rehab after they get in uh, legal trouble, right? And it's just the way our, our system is. You, know, you go to rehab, looks good on the court. Maybe you need some help. Maybe you don't. And, uh, you know, it so, shows effort. But my parents are, are first-generation immigrants, hardworking people, and uh, they get the call from the principal. Like, you think he's in the gang, he's selling you know they're 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 sending his the baby boy over to rehab real yeah, quick, right. real quick. Our little boy's destroying his life. Yeah, off of what little principal said. Yeah, you know, and, and it was it was kind of a, a point of resentment. So I was a I was a young man that had a lot of beliefs, even at fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, where I was like, man, this should not be illegal. And I remember the the principal saying, like, look, I don't care what political beliefs you have, this and the other. And I just kept my mouth shut. I was just like. Just trying not to get in trouble. And what, what, what helped me was, you know, I was a really good student. 
all the teachers that he reached out to were like, he's a good kid. He's, he's a great kid. And, you know, he says, you know, you know, we didn't catch with anything, this and the other. But my parents are like, you know, you're going, you're going to rehab. So I'm sitting in rehab and I'm pissed off, buddy. I'm like, you know, I'm just smoking weed, dude. Like, you guys are Indian. You don't get it. Like, this is what kids do. Da, 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 da. They're trying to just protect me, right? I'm trying to make sure I don't go down the wrong right. path. But me, I was just mad, man. I was like, man, I'm I'm, I'm a senior. I got good grades. I got accepted into college. Right. I'm a grown ass man. I'm a grown ass. Right. I know what I'm doing. I got this. So, yeah. so anyway, I, I don't get into legal trouble at that point. But you know, I, I did definitely uh, didn't didn't see any problems with what I was doing. And uh, it's uh, I go to college after all that. And you know, me college was like, I I got a full ride to FSU, right? And, okay. and, and, I, and I got in the USF, and that's in Tampa where I grew up. And I was like, I want to stay home. Think about go, staying home when you got, you know, you got friends, which they're the bad kids. Oh, well, listen, I like at a certain point, I became the wrong crowd too, right? So I made a choice to do what I was doing. And uh, I go to USF, and I made it about two months, buddy. I made it about two months. This uh, this dude, uh, I'm, I'm selling weed again, and this guy he hits me up. He's like, Hey, man, like, can you get mushrooms? And I was like, I don't do that, but I know the guy. So I called the other guy on the other the floor. And then we're in his dorm room partying, smoking, drinking, whatever. I leave. I go home, right? And uh, his buddy from out of town, Coral Springs, comes over. They eat mushrooms, eat ecstasy, get too crazy. He runs around naked, uh, goes into the wrong girl's dorm room. It's co-ed dorm. Cops show up. He punches the cop. Cop maces him. He's, he's high on mushrooms, weighing 250 pounds, running around out the emergency exit. And, uh, you know, so they, they didn't really, you know, they, they didn't really like the fact that a police officer got sucker punched. Right. And if you see the mugshot of this guy, you know, I look at it time and time, his face is just like, just not, it looks, it the looks cop. bad. No, the guy that, that punched the cop, and then when the other seven cops showed up, they, oh, they, they, they you know, they, right. they they put a whooping on him. Meanwhile, I'm I'm not paying attention to any of this. I'm out of town. I'm back at my mom and dad's house and doing whatever little hood rat stuff I was doing. I mean, obviously, I got told on. Right, so I'm I'm leaving my dorm room on Monday. This will happen like on a Friday, and uh, I got three eights bagged up, making my rounds. I'm gonna go see the frat boy over there, a frat boy over there, and then I'm gonna go to my ethics class. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I remember it was it was the irony, it was best. the ethics class. It's just too all right, but I see this little little pile park there, and I'm like, hmm, what's dude trying to rob me? Because like as soon as I turn my car on, I flick the little unlock button, I see it turn over. He's parking in a weird spot, so I keep going. Didn't realize it's an unmarked car. It's a detective. Because the guys that did the mushrooms and all that decided to just say, hey, it's that guy, right? Mm -hmm. So immediately I get pulled over. What's ironic is I snuck around. I tried to, like, get away. And I was driving to the police station. So I was like, somebody's trying to rob me. They're going to rob me at the police station, right? And uh, it turns out I was driving away from a cop. Long story short. To the police station. Long story short. You know, they, they, they see that I'm... Uh, selling marijuana on a college campus which gives you the within a thousand feet of a school and everything oh, it's man. just you know it is what it is right, it's like a hate crime yeah it's like getting yeah. a hate crime for drugs i might as well have been outside of uh the the, pre the pre-k school as far as the law is concerned right. you know uh selling selling nicks to five-year-olds i guess i don't know but uh you know so i get i get kicked out of school i get suspended got to go back to rehab this and the other parents and, are pissed my dad was pissed my mom was just heartbroken, you know, like listen to your mom cry for three nights in a row while you're sleepless thinking about, man, like, cause you just think about Indian families, especially, and there's a lot of families that are the same way, whether it's Indian or not, their whole life was designed around the idea that you get your kid educated in America and you send him off to college and he gets a big boy job. Now, is he a felon? Is he ever going to be employable? Da, 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 da. She's so disappointed, right? Yeah, she's heartbroken. She's heartbroken. I'm, I'm, I'm a nervous wreck, and I'm just kind of sitting back at mom and dad's. And my life's over, and da, da da da. Because, you know, the whole time it was like the programming I got was like, you're going to go to college, you're going to get educated, you're going to end up flipping burgers or Burger King. Now here I am, a six figure entrepreneur, and I know that's not the case because much later in life I became a convicted felon. Mm -hmm. And much later in life, when I became a convicted felon, there was no denial because I, I graduated from from just selling herb and smoking herb back when I was 18, 19 to doing a lot more, you know, and that's kind of where I believe in the disease model of addiction. I believe in both the science and the 12 step and the spiritual side. I was an addict before I ever smoked weed in eighth grade. Okay. The, the addictive behavior was there when I was playing video games until five in the morning. 
uh, to access and sleep him through class, right? I never got caught doing those things, and I still made it by just fine, didn't get in trouble. But out in the real world, <laughs> I learned quick. It's interesting enough because I've been talking about that a lot lately, the dopamine hits that you get from games or uh, Instagram, TikToks, that rabbit hole that we go down, whatever you want to call it, pornography. There's a lot of things that set those same receptors off. And you're pretty much saying that you were predetermined to be that way because of those things. Because I'm always curious, what are we doing to the kids by giving them these phones? Mm. I'm curious. Yeah. What are we doing? What are we teaching them? What is their brain? What is setting off in their brain? Are we setting an expectation that their brain's supposed to be set off on that nine or 10 level in all of life? And it's just not going to happen. And I'm worried. I just makes me curious if it does create something like you're saying, because you started out being addicted to one thing, it turns into another, turns into another, turns into another. Yeah. I think, um, I think there's a lot of like undiagnosed addiction out there in society and especially in modern society with how much the phone, I really think that stuff scrambles your brain, but I don't know. That's a side note. I think I was born with just a different buildup where my brain just prioritizes that dope, mainly dopamine. There's other things going on in our brain with these reward systems. But for some reason, I'm wired up to where I'm going to promote that. I'm going to prioritize that over a lot of other stuff that your non-addicts are just not going to do, right? They're not going to show up and smoke a blunt on the top of the courthouse before they got to go on jury duty, you know? Right. They're going to say, like, hey, I might, you know, just do that at home, not do that. So like I, I do, I do stuff that's, uh, which I consider a little bit insane when I'm really in that active part of prioritizing a, and, and like you just alluded to, it's not, it can be the phone. It mm -hmm. can, it can be attention. Mm -hmm. It can be attention and validation. Mm -hmm. It can be, uh, you know, like right now where it's really manifesting for me is all this AI stuff and business, right? Like I'm building really, really great stuff. So that's the, that's the thing about the dopamine too. It's the reason I call the channel spanking monkeys. Cause I feel like we're all savage. We're all monkeys. We're all going after what makes us feel best, mm. but learning how to turn it from a pill or a joint or a bottle of liquor or something into something like you're doing where you're getting those dopamine hits from success. I think that is the journey. I think that is the road turning those things on so that you get done that job. You feel as good as you would feel whatever, doing whatever, insert, thing here mm -hmm. so let's rewind back to uh getting charged so then you finally catch charges for selling too yeah i mean uh at 18 I, you know i got busted selling cannabis at uh 18 my case gets dropped over a technicality dad paid for a really good lawyer mm -hmm. and uh he, he found like some old case law some precedent where oh it was improper backing fruit of the poisonous tree blah blah, blah. so you know at, at 18 I, I always had this entrepreneurial spirit, right? And I, and I think it manifested in certain ways, but I was also very much trying to make my own way, right? So I had a lot of budding heads with my father and just really feel like I lost a lot of control in my life. And, and I felt like I had lost all these things and still the guy that was selling weed to fit in and make a little money and smoke for free was, was just like plotting and scheming. So, you know, I stayed clean, sober, whatever you want to call it. I wasn't even, I was going to 12 steps. I had to part of me going back to college was I had to go complete an inpatient rehab, but I'm comparing, I'm measuring myself and who I am compared to everybody else in the room. So the way I process all the stuff that happened, and I've thought about deeply on this obviously is number one, money gets you out of trouble because the $2,000 lawyer wasn't saying shit about, I can get this dismissed. He is saying, I can, you know, I can cop out. I can help you cop out. But right, I can send you to jail and start your felony career. That didn't even try, right? And this mm -hmm. is this is different different topic. But this is where my brain was. Is like if you're talented, you're smart, you can make more money, and if you have more money, you can get out of trouble. And the, the sad thing is, is, that is true, right? That is, is very much the case. And I didn't learn anything. I was still rebellious. I still want to do my stuff. I didn't feel like I had any issues. I felt like society had the issue. I felt like my parents had the issue. I felt like the justice system was corrupt for criminalizing a plant. All things that I think are very valid objections. And this is the consequence of, you know, years of, of slavery. Because I had it good compared to people. But I remember sitting on my couch, right? A little story. Like I remember sitting on my couch two days after my dad bailed me out of jail. The first time I got arrested and I'm watching like one of those campus cop shows and this kid gets pulled over probably my age gets a scale, gets pulled over in California with a scale ounce of herb, bunch of baggies. They just legalized it back then in Cali before Colorado even had their stuff. He gets a hundred dollar ticket. He gets to drive off. 
Meanwhile, your boy here had 22 grams of herb, which is just two grams over the felony possession limit. I get hit with a second to whatever degree felony because I'm on a college campus, right? Now, all this stuff, so like, it, and I'm sounding mad because that's literally what it was when I was a kid. I was just like, this shit doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. None of you people make any sense. So why should I participate and, and do all this stuff? And, and I just wanted to rebel, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and Take and, my ball and go home. Yeah, but, but what did that look like for me? Well, fight with my dad. Move out, sleep on my girlfriend's couch, sell weed to his dad, or her dad, and uh, just just try to turn a little baby Scarface with, with with like a little half pound of weed, and and uh, you know I'm running the streets, learning learning the real world very firsthand, and uh, developing street smarts, <laughs> and uh, experiencing it, it in order to that's that's different than watching movies. Ain't it? It Think is. You know something until you get out there and get in it. And it's a lot of power too, right? When you get into that lifestyle, and I've thought deeply on this, it's like when I get into it, it's more like people pleasing, and I'm trying to fit in, and like, hey, I got this thing that you can pay me for, which kind of transfers in relationships too, stuff that I've, I've realized. But you get addicted to that, right? Just like in real estate, being you know? that guy. Just like in real estate, like when I went through uh, as a convicted felon, and I had to go through all the hoops, and I had to change my life, and had people like vouch for me that were valuable members of society, and I reformed. And I get that first check, and it was just like, man, this is this is nice, this is real, real nice. It was the same thing back then. It was like, man, like it's it's that freedom, right? When you when you've been locked down, you feel like you lost all this stuff, da 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 da. And all I knew was go to college. That's not that's not that's, that was on the table actually. My parents actually got me a community college and everything, but it's it's that fast money, right? It's like that instant gratification. It's that 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 dopamine hit. That is just so so much quicker than a four year degree that you really don't really care about because you didn't want to go to school anyway. Yeah. You're just told you're supposed to go to school. Or so. a forty hour week. Like if I work a forty hour week, if I can go steal shit in two hours and make the same money. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, there's a million different ways to go down that road, isn't it? There is, man. But that's why that's why I say like uh like uh, you know, you, you, my parents, God bless them, like they didn't know how to help me. Because I was just going to take, 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 right, take, Right, so you're take. still doing your thing, and then you get charged at a point to where you get the felonies, right? Yep. So you, do you do time on that? No. So I did, uh, at that point. At, and what yeah. did you get caught again with? You got caught with? Hydrocodone. At Vicodin, right? I had Alprazolam with some Xanax. I had 40 grams of psilocybin mushrooms. I had a half pound of herb and four grand in cash. Right? right. And this is in Tampa. Yeah. So they right. so they pull me over and I'm and I'm on Xanax at the time. They pulled me over for not wearing a seatbelt. That was the that was the reason, right? They just changed the law. You don't wear a seatbelt, you can get pulled over in Florida now. And I get pulled over and um you know, I, I remember the cop coming up and I was I still remember bits of it. Like I was on Xanax, so I remember bits of it. And I remember arguing with them because I always vacuum sealed everything. It's like, I, you know, I've been in trouble and I was trying to move right and all this. So there's no smell in my car. It was a hard and fast rule. There's no one smoking in my car because this is the work van, basically. There's right? a little Honda Accord. And I'm driving down uh, Waters Ave in Tampa, Florida, hometown. And I get pulled over for not wearing a seatbelt, going 500 the limit. Yeah, you know, I was I was doing all kinds of stuff before that. So it was, it was a matter of, uh, you know, it wasn't a happenstance, right? They were on to me. I was doing stupid stuff. And it was just a matter of time kind of deal. So he comes up and he's like, he's like, uh, I smell weed. And I was like, bullshit, you don't smell weed. Go call another cop, man. Like, and he's like, I don't do shit. I'm going to give you an obstruction charge too if you don't get out right now. Searches everything and he finds the triple seal, the half pound, a bunch of cash in the, in the, in the dash. Wasn't exactly, uh, uh, professionally trained <laughs> petty, petty drug dealer, you know. But, uh, I go to jail and I remember being in the back of the paddy wagon. It smells, dude next to me just smells like, absolute ass uh. they take me up into a room right and it's just this detective lady walks in she's got like nice long hair and then she's like so you got arrested with this and this like uh and i was just like and i remember what all all the dudes taught me right because i remember thinking i was like man like i don't want everybody to think i'm a rat that's a, that's way worse than anything else right like like that's way Definitely worse than talk anything else them. And come to find out later when I learned more about the legal system, as you typically do when you progress into that life, uh, hey, there's a reason we all have the same lawyer. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so yeah, I was just a naive, dumbass kid and I uh, got in a bunch of trouble. I remember getting out of jail and I called my buddy. He's got, he's got my safe, you know, he's got my safe. And I had like 23K sitting in there and I wasn't calling my dad. I was like, yeah, go post bond. You know, they're going to want like 20%. And da da da. da. He, he he posts me and he pulls me out. He's got a blunt rolled up, 
And I remember thinking, like, I'm going to call my plug because I don't want him to find out anywhere else. Yeah. He's like, so I want to keep this party going. So I call him. I show up probably like three, four hours later. And I'm like, first thing, I'm nervous. So I was like, yeah, I got arrested. And he just stops and he looks at me. And what happened? I kind of told him. I was like, I was just like, da, da, da. And he's like, cool. Yeah, that's why you're supposed to handle that, though. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the... You got nothing to hide if you ain't doing nothing wrong. I just didn't want to let it up. It was my ego, my reputation, and everything else. But what do I do? <laughs> I get out with all these charges. It's like, hey, man, these lawyers ain't cheap. I'm getting 10000 here. He's saying this much, that much. My money's a little jacked up because I just took, like, a big, like, $8,000 mm -hmm. loss. So I just doubled down, man, which is absolutely crazy, right? But this is this is where the the first sign of of actual uh, addiction addiction to substances really starts to flare up in my mind, right? I could look back and, and mention some other things too, but really this is where it's just a major just. Did you got four really big charges? You got a pending court case. You know you you, you should not be out here doing the same exact thing. Right, but it's also like all you knew at that point too, right? Yeah. Like that's all you knew for what you was doing on the hustle and had you been working, you were going to school, right? So you knew school, but you didn't really know working. As far as money, money had always been a hustle. Yeah, I was I was in it, right? I was in it and that's all I knew and that's that was where all you know, everything went. So I get sentenced to probation. My lawyer, you know, five G's, he's like, Don't do anything crazy and I'm lying to him, even though he's my lawyer. Right. I'm treating him like every other authority person. Of course. I just want to do what I want to do. And uh, I kept getting robbed because I kept doing Xanax. Couldn't make it through rehab because I got triggered. I walked out. Still doing what I'm doing, doing what I'm doing. Get sentenced to probation. And uh, like I remember talking to my mom and she's worried. So she knows what I'm doing and everything. I was like, all right, I got to tighten up. Right. So let me get back into school as I stop going. Get sentenced to felony drug court in Florida, which it's not a drug court up here. I know drug court up here sucks. I would say it sucks more down there. <laughs> okay. Just, just, just from the sense of they're more, they're less, they're more forgiving down there. Like you could piss dirty this, that, and the other. And uh, I never did right until like a, a month till, and it's eighteen months. I got to go to classes three times a week. Still got to see a PO. I'm still going to school full time, doing this and. Um, you know, I'm I'm going the whole time. I never got caught until the last month because, uh, you know, I confused uh, so, some some white powder at a party. It wasn't even a party. It was more of a transaction that turned into four hours of just getting high and staring off into space. It's just kind of, you know, we glamorize it, but what were we really doing, right? right? And uh, but for the for the 18 months, I was doing everything. I kind of found the dark web. You know, I was kind of like an early adopter of that, and uh, it's it's funny what happens, right? You know, you're just you're just some nerdy looking Indian dude that figures out how to do a little PGP, a little bit of order this or that, get the Bitcoin from there. This is back when you can still go up into Walmart, grab a green dot for a thousand bucks and then do, do a little transfer and all that. And um, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, man. So, so, the, so all that, that shit was, right there could be another language as far as I'm concerned. That was my life. I'm just then, a dumb man. redneck from Winchester V. <laughs> you gotta talk to me like I'm stupid sometimes. <laughs> So this you're talking about crypto though you're talking about yeah I figured out how to buy drugs online okay and that was right when so I so you're on using probation. crypto to get shit sent to you yeah I never sent it to me I was um I was always partnering with people and that like hey let me use your address because I'm on felony drug court and maybe right. they can search this place at any point and uh, yeah man I remember ordering like my first gram of MDMA and this is back when the rave culture was kind of taking off and I remember getting it from the Netherlands and it came in like two weeks. And I went and sold it, and I was just like, "Man, this is great! I'm gonna do. I'm gonna keep doing this." Hmm, what kind of profits are you making there? Like, what? What? Are you, how much you spend, and how much you making? That year went really fast, right? So I started with really no money, like just bills and school and probation and lawyer bills and all this. So I get that half gram. And I remember getting ten minutes of acid. Fast forward a year later, and I got well over uh, like a hundred k. Uh, well, well over, in uh, just shoe boxes and street fronts, and there's a package going everywhere. And the profit margin obviously gets a lot better when you go a little more wholesale. Right. You know? Yeah. And um, you know, I always said like, yeah, I'd be like, 
I, I was I was only smart because I got in trouble. So I remember always like even when I moved to Virginia, I was always looking at the laws. Like what's the what's the limitations here? Like when, when do I start getting in real trouble if I get caught up with this? Because you know to me that's just that's just if you're in that life, like you're gonna do it. You better know what you're getting into. And you better be willing to sit with that, right? Yeah, facts. Like that that's just how I was. Yeah, so I was like, okay, well, if so, you climb so, ladders all day, you gotta expect to fall sometime. Yeah. So selling cocaine and selling this and selling that it wasn't it, at that time it wasn't really an ethical thing it just didn't make sense to me it's like dude i get busted with 200 grams of that and i'm, I'm going bye-bye and and i know what that looks like right you're doing 85 and, and all mm -hmm. that and i was like i'm not willing to do all that but hey you know like uh 15 pounds from cali every week from uh from the sour diesel man that sounds like a plan that sounds like a plan and uh that scales up really quickly and uh, especially when you're not getting high right so I wasn't getting high because I wanted to fill in a drug court. And uh, I wasn't getting high, I should say. And then I found my my DOC. And I, I use the, the air quotes here because I would say ketamine is my DOC, but it was the one thing they didn't test for. So, you know, I'm on a color code. I got to call in every weekday before 3 p.m. I better show my ass up and drop and all that. And uh, I just didn't want to get in trouble. So I'm doing this stuff and I hated it. It was like a rave thing. And I was like, ah, it's just something to do, right? But eventually you get a taste for something. And um, by the end of that year, though, man, I was completely out of my mind. I didn't trust anybody around me. Uh, I was doing extremely stupid stuff. See, I think what ketamine is one drug I've never done. And so explain what ketamine does to your, how does it make you feel? Can you compare it to anything? You ever done PCP? It? PCP? Yeah. Yes. So think of PCP. And I've never done PCP, but chemically, they're very, very similar. Okay. The effects are a lot different in a sense. But this is this is where you know I look at like whatever you do, whether it's a substance or anything. The, you know, I think of Jack Kerouac, who's this writer, and he, he had these like long written things. But there's a lot of like escapism, and that's what it is, right? It's like when we're we're trying to escape from self and alter this mood and mind because we're just not right. Like the inside is not in harmony with the outside, and we have this solution in a chemical or or an action, sex, drugs, rock and roll, whatever you want to do, and that helps you escape. So ketamine to me is when you take a bump, you get a little wonky. It's a club drug, right? So it's like you feel kind of drunk almost. Okay. Everything feels a little more spacey okay. and like music sounds cool. But if you cross that threshold, you know, you get into like a K-hole and it gets right, real, it gets, it gets real psychedelic. Right? It gets real, real psychedelic. And that's where it's it's a true just dissociation. It's a dissociative drug. They use it as an anesthetic. They use and it in PCB Vietnam. Is very dissociative. It is. And it used to be an anesthetic too until, you know, the guy turns into the Hulk while he's mm -hmm. under the, the knife. Doesn't really work too well as an analgesic, anesthetic kind of drug. Ketamine, it, it's, it stops the nerves from talking, so it is a painkiller in that sense. But I always felt like it was, I had a very psychedelic relationship with it, right? Like I loved those kales. I remember like Sons of Anarchy came out and I got these vials from India. And I don't know what was going on in the show, but I just remember just, just k holing for like a week and a half straight, right? And at the end of it, you know, I'm 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 just it, it, whatever you do, it's taking a toll in some way, right? Some kind of way. Yeah. Some people get that long, slow bleed from from that undiagnosed alcoholism, where you know they didn't go to jail, they didn't sell drugs, they didn't do all these yeah, these yeah. these out, outlawish kind of behavior things. They're like, you know, I go to work. It's Miller time at five o'clock. I provide for my family, da da da. But meanwhile, like that's to me, that's the worst thing, man. That's the worst fucking thing, dude. I'd much rather my story is like I get in trouble quick, but I get in trouble and this happens, and it's not like a, a, a small dose for, for of trouble for most people. And I'm grateful for that because, I, you know, I got a high pain tolerance. I gotta, I gotta really get into some shit and consequences and touch that stove before I really, really take some some uh, yeah, prophylactic yeah, measures. Get burnt and get burnt. Yeah. Yeah. So ketamine's uh, it, it's trip, man. It's trip is the way I look at it. Okay. And then, like, how long are you using that? So I, I guess that was more of a binge thing for me. Like, mm -hmm. like weed was my thing, and um, it's um, it, with ketamine, man. Like, if I look back on my story, you know, they say in recovery, they say you got to play the tape back. You know, like what what happened, and now I play it so far back, and that the problem wasn't the K. It wasn't the fact that about every year. To a year and a quarter, I would decide I'd get like like a gram or two, and that would turn to like an ounce, and that would turn into a week or two, where I'm just doing stupid stuff, getting kicked out of concerts is usually what happens. But then I start, you know, as time goes on, my brain is just not tolerating that the amounts and what I was doing, and I would really just feel the the hangover and the personality changes and all those things. 
much like anybody who does any other hard drug. Right. I consider this a hard drug. Most people consider it, it's all relative to what you what your bias is and your experience, but to me, it's a hard drug, right? Um, it's uh, it, it, it's definitely been the case over the years where when that's not there, I'll get in trouble with alcohol. I'll get in trouble with. I was never a cocaine guy. Never done heroin. Never done meth. And, and I don't say that because of like a oh I'm better than kind of thing. It's to me, I think society has really just kind of just put so much weight on one thing versus the other, right? Like I grew up in freaking Florida, bro. Where like the thirty milligram oxy was 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 at a pain clinic, and there's five other pain clinics, and every license plate is Virginia, West Virginia, Kentucky, this that, and the other. I did oxy when I was a kid, but I just I just never looked at it as like this thing. And I would jump, and I was very much like, hey, you know, I'm not going to do that for more than, like, 30 days because that's when you get into some shit. And I remember seeing the guys, like, who would – I remember the one time the guy sells me 100 of these pills. And this is right when I, when I bought them for the first time. I was literally just buying because I had too much money, and I was just trying to be a cool guy, right? And he calls me four hours later because I guess his other play didn't work out. And he's like, he's withdrawing. He's going – he's, he's withdrawing. He's freaking out. And he's like, hey, man, I'll buy that back for me right now for twice as much. And in my head, I'm like, yo, this is a dope boy. Like, this dude's got guns, and he's a badass, and he's got a nice car, and he's over here like a slave to this shit. Yeah, facts. He's a fucking slave to this shit. No matter how much money you got, don't matter it don't care, family bro. background is. It does not care. Addiction no, does not discriminate, does. man. It's a great, it's, it's, it's a great equalizer. <laughs> it definitely does not, man. Yeah. Uh, I remember we used to, and we would all do it to the point where we would have five or six oxys, but... When you knew you only had one, talking about somebody would offer you a hundred bucks for that twenty dollar pill. So I only only had one all the time. I got one. That's it. Nah, man, I can't give you my last pill. I only got one. I'll give you a hundred dollars for it. Okay. <laughs> I take my hundred dollars and I go get my pills and you know what I mean. But that's just the nature of the game, ain't it? Because I knew I could go buy five more. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so you don't even care about what happens. So other consequences, man, like was there other consequences for with using for you? Like besides I mean, I know you went to jail. You didn't get you didn't have to stay there long. What's today's date, man? The tenth, I think. So I had a I had the love of my life when I was younger, right? Like was engaged, engaged to be married, fiance, all that. And at the end of that year, I was telling you about, like, you know, I had so much trouble that uh, from what I was doing. I wouldn't get caught and get in trouble, but I just saw the signs, right? Like, it's just a matter of time kind of thing. So I'm sitting there, and we had our ups and downs, left and right, but this is like the puppy dog love kind of stuff. And I'm getting, I get off felony drug court, and my lawyer, he now knows a little bit more what I'm doing. He's like, you need to stop. <coughs> we need to do something different because this is not, this is federal. If you get caught up, then I can't do anything for you. And, um, I ran like a little, like I ran, I ran. I left, left the girl, left the friends. I remember, I remember watching like Heat one day when I was younger, and it was just like Heat to me. It's like, what are you willing to do to not get in trouble right now? And, and I hopped on a plane, left a lot of stuff behind, and a lot of people that took advantage of that, people I considered friends, and you know had resentments there. And I realized like, I was using you in, in recovery. It's like I was using you too, so I, I had my part and all that. So come to terms with that stuff. What I can come to terms with is, you know, there's something, you know, there's opportunity costs, right? Like my parents don't get that time back. My mom doesn't get that back. I don't get all that back. I don't get to take back all the call, the pain, the damage and all that. The big one for me was, you know, I lost, I lost her. Like literally, you know, she, she committed suicide. Uh, I think it's her birthday today is why I asked. It's kind of, kind of a, one of those numbers, right? Mm -hmm. She's in, uh, in active addiction. She had mental health issues. She had so did alcoholism that got worse after I left, I think. And, uh, you know, for years, it was like, that was the love of my life, man. In my head, it was always like that uh, that uh, hero's journey that was just, just waiting to be filled out. It was like, I was going to go get rich. I was going to be successful. And, um, you know, all these things, I never got that that chance, right? And uh, I remember the last thing I said to her was when I was in NRADC. So I had certain numbers memorized. And I would call her, right? And, and she wasn't answering the phone. And, and it really bothered me that she wasn't answering the phone. Then she finally answers me, and she's just like, you know, get some help. And that was the last thing, and she committed suicide. Like, hmm. and, and, and that was the one where it's like, you know, what have you lost? <laughs> what, what have I lost, man? I lost a lot. Right. I lost a lot. So when you left everything there, like, that was just like a, a choice to say, I'm getting away from all this and starting over? And where'd you go? I went to India. So, you know, um... 
I went to India and I was trying to, you know, a lot of people in the seventies and eighties, they like the hippie culture to like go to India to find themselves. I was going to India to run away and, and it wasn't like hiding per se, but it was, there was an element of hiding. So I go there for a year and, and, uh, funny enough, like my uncle, he's, um, you know, like our, our that line of the family, he was, he was a heroin addict in India in like the eighties. Right. He was like the the firstborn son, wealthy family. Like my great grandfather started like a pharmaceutical business. Ironically enough, more of a distribution business. Ironically enough, above board, right? And uh, so they were really wealthy, but uh, you know, India's still kind of messed up more so back then. He was a he was a heroin junkie, so he's living in train stations, eyeing dope in his sock. Has no fucking like just like me, right? I had no business out here, right. like freaking eating out of trash cans. Basically, he's freaking eating out of trash cans, right? And uh, anyway, so his father passes away, and you know, money, family, weird real estate court system there. Like the, the vultures come in, they start grabbing this, grabbing that, grabbing this. So you know, he has three younger siblings, and they really blame him to this day for being a junkie, and you know you weren't there for mom. And if you'd been in the business, they wouldn't have been able to take advantage. And your brother, your younger brother was still 17. He couldn't do anything. So just a lot of resentment that he's had to take the brunt of from all the non addict family members, right? My mom, other uncle, sister. So he got clean years and years later in narcotics anonymous in India. So the narcotics anonymous is a, is a, is a worldwide program. So, you know, I, I went to, I went to meetings down there for a year <laughs> Uh, while I was there on and off and um, it was in Hindi and I don't speak Hindi and mostly I was just thinking about that I was wondering like, yeah. how did you communicate you know in, in uh, South Bombay in Mumbai right like well most people speak enough English uh, as far as like people that I wanted to talk to you know everything else is like see by and you know tell Gabby mm -hmm. where to go kind of stuff but uh, you know it's it's uh, it was an experience I wasn't really uh, drinking the Kool-Aid at the point I was just kind of like FOMO. I was like, man, I miss it. I miss the life. I miss my girl. I got to get back. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to get, get, da -da 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 -da. and, uh, you know, um, you, anywhere you go as, uh, someone who, who likes to, to, I, 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 saw, I found it, right. I found what I was looking for out there, which was hash and, and this, that, and the other and getting drunk and never found the ketamine. That was my, my big goal. Uh, but never found that. Uh, but I come, I, you know, I was just always looking for the next hustle, next little thing, and and uh, met people in India that were much like me, and that's a whole other saga that starts. But it was just years, man, of just, like, back and forth, court dates. You know, after 19, I didn't get in trouble, like, trouble, trouble for a really long time. Uh, crashed a car once, you know, and uh, just lots of stories, man, like getting beat up, talking too much at the bar, uh friends relationships ending because of uh money stuff and right, just so, you know. like what do you do now like to make sure that you don't like do you ever get a hey i feel like i should get a gram academy right now yeah so that's a that's a that's a deep one man because like at a certain point i got so frustrated that the denial was done right that i tried to like do i tried to do kratom bro like when i got when i got out of jail and i was like i'm just gonna be kratom it's legal it's it's this that, and the other and that dude like I couldn't poop for a week because I right. do because I do more than than the average yeah, human yeah. because that's my thing so I got a job and you know I'm learning construction I'm learning the trades this that, and the other and then I go back out and COVID happened and da da da, da. fast forward man I really got humbled I got really really humbled uh, December twenty twenty. I remember, uh, like, I was just licked, man. I was just licked. And I wasn't doing anything illegal. I would stopped that life. I was nobody. I was living in a sober living house in Winchester, Virginia, where I'd been for, like, two years on and off. It always felt like a jail sentence. It always felt like, man, I'm here because cause I got to be here. And then once I get out, I can start living life, which, you know, if you, li if you operate like that, I never knew Winchester. I never knew anybody. I was just I was just uh, an inmate, whether or not I was in, in that jail cell, right? Mm hmm the, the insanity of my stuff really took off in, in like 2018, which, you know, we're going to we're gonna not go too deep into that side. But, like, I ended up in jail, uh, broke into, a, into an Indian restaurant in the middle of the night. And um, it was a direct result of me saying, I'm just going to drink and smoke weed. It wasn't the fact that I had done ketamine and hadn't slept and I went into psychosis. And I thought some kid was trapped inside of this Indian restaurant in Winchester, Virginia, because I'm hallucinating and da-da-da-da. It goes right back to the point of like, hey, you know, 
I had all this evidence that I probably shouldn't be drinking and drugging and d- hanging out with these people. And I said, no, nah, well, I, I got it this time. It was different this time. And, you know, where do I end up? Back in the, back in insanity. But this was the worst, right? Like, I'm sitting in jail, sitting in jail, really lost my sanity. We got the felonies, which, honestly, it, it felt like, man, this is over. And it was probably the best thing that happened. So I, I had so much trouble deciding which route I wanted to go, this route, that route. When that happened, it was just like, I remember getting out of jail finally. I was just like, cool, internet marketing. That's it. Like, ain't, ain't nobody giving me a real estate license. I don't want to do. I don't want to be a real estate agent anyway, right? I get out. I'm in an Oxford house, and I start building websites. Start learning Facebook advertising. Start uh, reaching out. Got one one client who's one of my best friends now, and uh, blew up his business. You know, he went from like a second year real estate agent to uh, me running his Facebook ads and his lead conversion, and just learning as I go. Because I had all those options taken off the table, and I was like, okay, cool. I'm on probation. I know what to do here, right? And just just do the stuff. Learn something legal. You had to learn a legal hustle. It's the hardest part, man. The Commonwealth, you know, God bless Commonwealth, because this is a strict state, buddy. This is a strict state. Like, Florida, like, you know, you can be in and out, in and out, bond, probation. This place is like, man, you guys are making me a felon? I got I got no, ECO. You're not going to keep going in and out of this jail without getting a hard time. They're gonna, eventually, it's going to be enough to send you away for a while. Yeah. Yeah, it's not you, just going to keep you. And that's a, I've seen people that go in and out and just have them little 10, 15-day stints their whole life because <laughs> they never catch a felony charge, you know what I mean? But it's drunk in publics and shit like that. You're not yeah, going to catch up nah. the charges. You're not going to yeah. go out here in society and yeah. fuck things up around here and just keep getting away with it. No, yeah, it's good. It's a strong deterrent, right? That's the idea of the, the justice right, well, system. it's better than New York where they're just letting people right back out that killed somebody the day before. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, there's other places way worse. I feel like we got to have a little law in order, don't we? Yeah, it's just, it's weird for this guy to be saying it. I'm, I'm sure you probably feel the same yeah, way. Well, I looking to back, cops, bro, but I understand yeah. what they're yeah. here for. You know what I'm saying? I still don't love them, you know what I'm saying? But you got to understand that their chances of them just getting that job to hurt people is not, you know what I mean? I don't feel like a lot of them go, hey, I just want to beat people up. Let me be a cop. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I understand how difficult it is, and I've had plenty of bad experiences, and I think there's a lot of like uh, silence that needs to stop on that side, especially. But yeah, you know, my my experience, my sure. ex, my experience was like a mixed bag. Is like before I broke into an Indian restaurant, I'd been stopped because I was out of my rabbit ass mind. So that you know, the, I was walking down the side of the road, highways. I walked from walked from like freaking Fairfax to Warrington, uh, just 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 walking, man, just walking, mm. doing my little little desert spirit quest, like a Indian off the reservation, you know, and. uh so some of the cops would stop me and it's, it's still weird to me and I get it. So you got personal freedoms and then you also got like protecting us from each other. They would literally four different times. I got taken to a hospital, Fauquier County, somewhere in Arlington, somewhere there in a two week period prior to getting arrested where they can tell I'm not all there. So they can do what they can, which is draw some blood, ask me the questions. But even though I'm out of my mind, I don't trust authority figures. And you're and I'm pissed because you're literally grabbing me up off the street. I don't know my rights, right? And, and, and I didn't. And they were trying to help, but there was just no stopping me. Because every time they get in there, you're hearing stuff, or you want to hurt somebody, you want to do this. Again, you're locking me up, buddy. Like I'm too smart for this, right? Yeah. Which which culminates in me just you know sleep deprivation is the the craziest stuff, man. But I took full responsibility for it in front of the real estate board years later, right? And I had. Uh, two years i think at that point where i had a track record of being clean and giving back and being a productive member of society job history and you know what's crazy is like if it wasn't for the people that 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 really encouraged me and believed in me it's weird because i'm really ungrateful as I, i'm thinking ungratefully as i say this but like i i was like ain't, ain't nobody giving me a fucking real estate license buddy i got a i got a burglary dropped down to a b and e that i'm still on probation for i vopped uh, off a drunken public. Why? Felt like it was why why like the f- why the hell were they? Why the hell would they give me a real estate license? And, and my mom and my buddy Brock, he, he they encouraged me, and I went ahead and did it, man. And there's no information on this, right? Like I'm googling, I'm YouTubing, I'm asking realtors, I'm asking people the realtors that that have kind of issues, and no, there's no manual on this except what deep or the the Virginia board, whatever, and, and you know. I had people encourage me and, and I passed that test. I'm book smart as all hell. I got great recall, all of that. But 
uh, you know, I had to wait a year and, and I had no expectations. I tried to have no expectations. That was the virtue. It wasn't done in practice. Never is. Right. I went in there and I laid it down. Like I really wanted it, you know, and I was honest and I owned my part and I, and I, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm definitely like, uh, like I set the deck where I can, but I go in there and I got to go through two hurdles and they, they say, you got your real estate license. You got two years of probation, which I just got off February 19th. I've never talked about this. So funny enough, it's just, uh, you, you know, so still, still protecting my brand, my reputation, mm-hmm. but I decided recently I, I don't care. So, um, you know, it's, it's funny because I walk out of there and, and I got the license and all this stuff and I don't want to go and brag about it. I don't want to go to meetings or tell people this, that, and the other. And my, my guy's like, man, you got to show people what it is. Cause like, and I'm not really a guy who likes to put my business out there to this day, you know, but it's, it is, it is something that I don't brag about because I'm so quiet. Cause I'm trying to hide it from like professional things, clients on Facebook and mm-hmm. YouTube. And they look me up and, uh, the reason I'm really open to this now is he's like, I'm, I've got so many skill sets outside of being a real estate agent. So I'm a great one that I'm not worried. Like it's 2024. You know, you, lean into it, bro. Leaning into it. Taking those, lean taking those it. options. Don't, don't, don't yeah. judge me on what I did yeah. in 2009. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or 2007 or, yeah. you know, 2015. What am I doing now? I mean, look at what I'm doing now. Cause I fucked a lot of stuff up, man. So I'm with you on that. Look at what I do today. Don't judge me on what somebody told you about me. Come talk to me. Yeah. Well, you know, at the end of the day, like I am a professional and like I respect my privacy and I don't think you need to put everything out there. But what I've learned in this this whole thing that you and I were kind of talking about creating content and, 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 and being on the Internet and doing things of that nature, the best thing you can the worst thing you can do. The absolute worst thing you can do is try to be for everybody. This goes for relationships. This goes for for business as well, though, because as soon as I, I I've taken those chances and made myself truly vulnerable and put myself out there, right, I attract more of what I want in my life anyway. Because mm-hmm. it's real, real recognizes real, bro. That's it. Straight up. That's, That's it. Just how it works. That's it. And and you know it's fucking exhausting being someone you're not. It is absolutely sure. exhausting, man. Sure. And that's why, like, in jail and this, that, and the other, it's like, I don't have to, like, go in there and try hard, be a Billy Badass, this, that, and the other. It's actually nice, you know, because, like, I'm, I'm, it's I'm so like. It's so much less stressful because, like yeah. you said, you wanted to be that guy when you were younger, man. And once you learn to just be you, people are going to like you for you, and everybody ain't going to like you, and that's fine. You don't have to be liked by everybody. That's it, man. You know what I'm that's saying? That's it. If you're successful, you're doing your thing, it doesn't matter what your past says, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, um. But, you know, that, that felon ass mindset, man, was always with me even before I was like a felon. Right. Which is like, ain't nobody giving me a chance. This is where I come from. This is my background. This is what I do. And like that, that to me is why, like, I have good people around me that they're the only reason I push for that. Right. They're the only reason I push that. Even, even last week when I'm going through it, same people that showed up for me back then show up for me now. The new people come to find out and it's easy to forget and repeat the past. Right. So this week in, in my business, and I've got three of them, right? I, I kind of had to shut the door on two people. And the reason being is, you know, you, you, especially when you get busy, you kind of realize like, man, what do I value in people? Hey, perfection. They that, That's what they're hearing. It's like, oh, you expect me. Man, you got to value my time and you got to show it. You can't just say it. You got to understand that when that becomes a pattern, I'm I'm one that's just like man, like you're just not capable. Right, you're not you're disrespecting at this point. Then that's the word I use. It is because, uh, dude, I have a buddy of mine that I will call him. Yeah, man, let's go do this, let's go do that. And then when I go to pick him up because he don't drive, I'm waiting mm-hmm. for five or ten minutes, bro, and I'm pissed. You know what I'm saying? I've left him. I've been like, dude, I'll be there in five minutes, three minutes. I'm around the corner. I'll be there in three minutes to get you, and I'm I wait two minutes, and he you know, I'm gone. Then he'll come out the door and call me. And I'm like, you just don't have any respect for my time or what I'm trying to get accomplished, bro. Everybody's got to do it what you want. And that's not cool. No, Especially no. not when you're trying to exist with someone and do something with someone. Right. How do you how do you what, how do you kind of measure like the difference between like someone you do business with versus someone who's a friend? Because you can do business with your friends. But how do you know? Like, Is, is there any like framework? This is in business, man. Yeah. I have friends that I tattoo on, and when I tattoo on them, it's business. Mm-hmm. Uh, they pay the same as everyone else. 
I might be like, yo, you owe me three fifty, but I'll do three hundred. Something like that. But it's business. They give me a deposit. Just like everybody else. Just like crazy, you know, motherfucker to call me that I've never talked to before. They're going to give me a deposit, but so is my best friend. Yeah. It's business, totally separate. And if you do make the trust list, because I know you're that type of person, I judge people based on what they do. So I've learned to expect people to be who they are. Mm-hmm. If you're always late, I expect you to be late. Yeah. If you're a fucking liar, I expect you to tell the, you know, never tell the truth. I'm a... Uh, the best dictator dictator of future behavior is past behavior, right? Sure. So, again, that's just kind of where I've been. And if you're that guy that is always on time, he always pays right, then I don't need your 60 bucks for a deposit. I don't need to worry about you not being here because I trust you to be here. You've showed me that the last 10 times. Yeah. Yeah. See, see that's where my struggle was this week, man, because – but a lot of it's greed is what I realized. Like, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm giving grace – and that's really just me justifying the fact that like I still got something to gain here, so I'm gonna look past all this. And then I'm what am I really doing? Is I'm setting myself up for for some. So that's when it comes into that's when it kind of sucks, doesn't it? It does. When you feel like I'm gonna give him another shot, I'm really frustrated or irritated at this point, but but I know shit happens, and you got this going on, and the 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 story is you know I see it. Now here's the thing, right? Is like when you talk about respect. Like if, if I do that, I'm not respecting my own time. You're not respecting yourself and you're not setting that line to tell people that you can do it. So interesting enough, uh, I used to have my stepdaughter clean my house. Mm. I pay a clean lady clean to clean my house, bro. It's just, it is what I it do is. the same. I weeks. do the same. And she's awesome. She kills it. You know what I'm saying? I keep things cleaned up, but she does the toilets and, and the tub and she fucking kills it. I love her. Yep. So I used to have my stepdaughter doing it. Cause I told her, why do I got to put all this money out there? You want these tattoos, come clean my house and I'll trade you. We get, you know, all this half her back piece done and all this stuff. And then she just stops doing her thing. She stops cleaning as good. And then she starts wanting to just not come. Oh, well, I worked yesterday and I can't come. So finally, it's a Saturday. I'm expecting to come. She calls and I fire her. I'm like, no, if you don't come today, don't ever come again. It's my stepdaughter, pretty much. You know what I'm saying? Like, I love her for like something under 10 years. I, I remember when she got her training bra for fuck's sakes. And now she's drinking alcohol. Yeah. But she had to learn to be, you know what I'm saying? You can't just expect me to give, give, give. And then when it comes time for you to give, you just want to call in sick. That's it, man. That's it. That, that's, and, and I'm trying to be better about, about kind of commuting this, communicating this stuff. Cause like my nature, I don't really like to talk about it, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and that's where I'm working on it. But you know, what I've, what I've really learned and, and I have to remind myself, the lessons always come, right? You never get it is how I look at it. There's certain things that I get, you know, but when it comes down to it, how do I say this? Right. It's, 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 it's for me to protect my time. It's for me to, to really lay down the difference when it's somebody that like, cause I like my friends, and we can be the best buddies outside of a working relationship. But the problem is, is you take advantage of it. And especially when I'm busy, I don't realize how much I'm give, 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 given. And then I'm catching a resentment and then I, then I blow up. And that's what I did this week. And it's not, it's not good. Yeah, it's it's not, not. And you don't like not, feeling that way. No, I it's don't. Co- it's I confusing don't. to your norm. It is. I'm with that too, because I, when I start to feel that, whatever, that irritation and over overwhelming whatever is going on where I'm just like, hold on, everything's got, I don't like feeling that way. Yeah. So I try to avoid those situations. Well, you know, the, the, the benchmark for me was like, and, and it's just a good call. I don't know for sure, but it's like, if we're friends, what does that mean? Well, you're going to be a friend to me. Assuming, you know, there hasn't been a whole pattern of fuck shit before that. If you're a friend to me, then you're still going to be my friend when I stop doing what you want me to do. Yeah. Right. Is that's 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 mm-hmm. it. It's like mm-hmm. if I'm only your friend mm-hmm. when I'm doing the things that you want me to do, then I, then I'm not really your friend. Right. I'm just I'm just I'm just right. like or how many like uh, I've had several jobs where I become friends with people, and, you know, because you're there every day with them. You're forced to be there with them every day. So you learn how to operate together. And then one of them gets another job. And hey, man, what's up? Like, you know, because you miss these people. You've been around them for a year or two, right? Yeah. And now it's like he's not there. It's like, yo, what's up, man? Let's get some of this. And next thing you know, it's six months. And next thing you know, it's two years. And next thing you know, you ain't even talked to them. Yeah, and it, and it happens, you know. Like, and that's where, like, you know, business is my is my craft, is my sport. Like, real estate is one business, you know, infopreneurship, marketing, and all these things. 
when it comes down to it, like every relationship does have the give and the take, right? There, right. there, there is a tra- a transaction every that time. is that is happening, right? So, so when it comes down to people that I used to do great business with, that I'm not in that business or this business, and we're not in the same geography, this, that, and the other. He's still a solid dude. If he reaches out to me, like that's a solid guy. Yeah, yeah, he's, sure. he's a solid guy. Well, you but set, you know, naturally we do drift apart. Yeah, and set your expectations to understand that you're gonna drift apart. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And don't hold resentment towards them for that. Um, but yeah, man, don't don't if you feel like these situations where these people that are your friends are working with you or for you or something like that and they're not working, just don't don't do it. Like, don't put those friends in those situations because you feel like you're helping them out. But in the long run, what's it end up doing? You're stressed out. You're not sure how they're taking it. And then the next thing you know, you flip out on them, fire them, and maybe you're not friends. Yeah. So yeah. it's like from the get-go, let's just stay friends, bro. That, that's where I'm at. And that's what I told dude. I was like, man, like, I was like, dude, I think me and you are just great at being buddies. Mm-hmm. But when it comes down to the bit, it's just not a good chemistry on that end, right? Yeah, learn like, that. And, and that's it. And, and there's there's business partners right now where there's no issue. It, it, there's still just not good chemistry because, you know, I'm learning in different businesses what it takes to be successful right? and, and be lean and all these things. And then, uh, you know, I catch myself getting resentful, resentful because it's like, man, like I'm doing my part. Where, where's that side? And then it's like, okay, like, yeah, we're actually just not capable of getting there yeah, together. Okay, so let me ask you this. Do yeah. you ever feel like you're expecting them to do something without you telling them your expectation? Because I find myself doing that. Yeah. I'll be expecting yeah. one of my friends to do this or that, and then they don't, and I'm mad at them. My and pro- then I'm looking at myself going, I'm mm. mad at you for not doing what I expected you to do that I never told you that I wanted to do. So that's Why the hell aren't you reading my mind right now? Exactly. Why, why the hell aren't you reading that's my mind? That's basically what right? it comes down to. Yeah, I think uh, you, you have a strong like driver personality like me in that sense. I'm really good about this just because I've been in so many bad business, this, that, and the other. Because up front, there isn't a contract. There isn't clear roles and responsibilities. The problem I have along that line is I talk so much. And a lot of the stuff I talk about is a little like heavy and technical and I mm-hmm. shouldn't be, shouldn't be burdening them with that. But then I'll say stuff in that, in those long things and I'll document it. And I'm not good at, as far as like project management and team management. So, so what I've learned very recently is that in, in one of my businesses, it just, it, I have to really vet who is going to be in it with me. Because if they don't have those natural skill sets, or, or I'm gonna, I'm not gonna have the the bandwidth to like ramp them up and train them how to get on camera and no. speak and do these things, no. while also keep that same business structure. Now, mm-hmm. the issue, the real issue, is the structure of the deal, and this is like a performance based thing. Without getting into the details, everything's fine and dandy when I do what you do, which is here's my fee, here's what's included, here's the expectations, very clean. The issue we're having now is like it is a very complex set of mechanisms and processes that make up a bigger business and it was just a broken it was a broken structure from and that's no one's fault and the beautiful thing is is everything that we built now we're taking that we're throwing it on uh, applying it in other areas and and he did good business he, did he fall short I, I definitely fell short but he always had good intentions he tried to communicate to the best of his abilities just like i did and there was no there was no like shifting blame there was no like, well, you did and da, da, da. and it wasn't me blaming him. It was you get those feelings, mm-hmm. but when you sit down, you, you you think through it. It was just you know, it's just. But that's it, man. Like business and friendship to me, I, I really try to try to just knock them out. But I love I love this stuff, you know. I love it. Yeah, man. So uh, it's getting hot in here. It's getting, it's getting, it's getting, getting warm. Getting so we're warm. open the doors up. Where can everybody find you? Like, do you have a main social media? Do you have a website? Like, how can people contact you for whatever reason? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, uh, I guess the the big one right now would be uh, theomniagent.com. That's a new startup. We're doing a lot of AI enabled voice calling. So you know, we do AI call centers. Okay. Uh, still, still working on some other stuff with real estate agents. But if you just want to connect on a personal level. Uh, v i h a n g, dot n a i r on Instagram. V hung Nair. and okay, if I'll you need, to, I'll try to put a link in the description. Please, if you get, if you forget, yeah. no worries. Just uh, either way, your name yeah. will be in the title. Awesome. So if anybody wants to search it, they can search it right in the title. Cool. Yeah, man, I appreciate you coming, bro. Uh, I appreciate I think it you. Started either. out to be a little something different than what you thought it was going to be, but it turned into a good conversation. I'd say so. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're a good host, and uh, I appreciate it. And we'll get another one. Yeah, in. man, you did well. Like you know, some people are nervous. You wasn't nervous at all. You knew what you was doing. Ah, oh, get Take excited, it. man.
Take it. So drop a like, man. If y'all want to reach out to the man, reach out to him. We're getting ready to talk about houses right now. Let's and let's let's get it, man. Myself, houses, man. and I'm about to talk about some tattoos because this, right, right. this is right. This is this, this is how this it works. You're supposed to barter a little bit. You're gonna give me a house. I'm gonna give you a tattoo. And not not help me with a house. You're gonna give me a house. I'm gonna give you a tattoo. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, man, likes are free, man. So drop a couple likes, man. You know, y'all know how this works. See you for the next one. Peace.